going to talk about what can go wrong with SQL statements, you know, when SQL statements attack or something like that. Um, and last time we had an insert statement, and I want to I want to think of all the things that could go wrong with the SQL statement, and then I want to talk about how we can prevent them, because. The one thing that I have focused on when I talk about what makes a good program is I've talked about maintainability. And absolutely that is one of the most important aspects of what constitutes a good program, is that it's maintainable. So it doesn't just do the job that it was supposed to do, but it can be expanded to do other things. Uh, and errors, if there, if there are any errors, they can be corrected. Um, if there is a... Um, if, if there is a change in the requirements or uh, an extension to the requirements, it can be accommodated without having to rewrite the whole thing. So that, that's a big criteria of what makes a program good. Another big criteria is, is fault tolerance, error handling. What happens when some unusual condition is met? Um, Now, um, in talking about that, you know, people, people before class were talking about this program crashing or that program crashing, right? Um, and the fact that it, quote, crashes without giving you any idea of what is wrong, you know, is an indication that there could have been better error handling. Now, again, it's not like I'm criticizing the people that wrote this or that program, but... Um, other than to say programs are incredibly complex and it's hard to anticipate every single thing that can go wrong. But one thing is for sure, you know some things can go wrong. And there, there's many things that, that can go wrong that we can anticipate. And there's some things that we can anticipate specifically what will go wrong, but we can anticipate that something could go wrong. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, you know, I know there's going to be, I know sometime in the next month there's going to be bad weather, for example. All right? That's probably a safe bet here in this area, that sometime over the next month there's going to be bad weather. Now, I can't tell you what that bad weather is going to be, right? It could be a thunderstorm. It could be snow. high windy. It could be snow. <laughs> it could be a blizzard. It could be a lot of different things. All right? So I might not know specifically what's going to go wrong, but I know there's a good chance that something's go wrong. So building programs in a way that, that can accommodate when unexpected things happen is important. Now I do want to differentiate between two kinds of errors because we're going to talk about errors and problems and we're going to be talking about a specific kind of error. All right? There are syntax errors and there are runtime errors. Or probably put differently, compile errors and runtime errors. Compile errors are, where you, are, are when you violate the rules of the language, all right? So if you were to say something like x equals y minus 2 minus, that's a syntax error. You violated the rules of the language. You can't just have a minus sign dangling out there like that. You need something after it. What happens when you get a syntax error? Your program just plain doesn't compile. It doesn't run. All right? You go to run it, you click debug or whatever, and it will say you had a build error. And then it will say invalid expression, blah, 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 and you go and fix it. These are not the kind of errors I'm talking about. These errors actually are the good errors because typically it tells you, like, what's wrong. It might not tell you precisely. You might have to do a little bit of interpreting but it tells you there's a problem with this statement, you know, here's what's wrong with it, and your program won't run. So the assumption is, is that you've gotten rid of all your compile errors or syntax errors. I actually lied. There's a third kind of error, and we'll talk about that uh, in a minute. Um, I, you know, it depends how you categorize it. You could probably come up with a million different kinds of errors. But me thinking in general terms, there are the syntax errors. Those are the good errors to have. 
because you can't go any further. You've got to fix it. All right? Second kind of error is runtime error. And that's what we're going to focus on today. Now, that occurs when you do not have anything that violates the rules of the language, but yet you've asked the program to do something that it can't do. Here would be an example. X equals Y divided by Z. Is that proper syntax? Absolutely. That's how you divide two things by each other. What could cause this to fail? If z equals zero. z equals zero, this blows up. So it doesn't violate the rules of language. It's a valid statement. But if z ever hit zero, boom, it explodes. All right? So that's a runtime error. Runtime errors typically are situational. What I mean by situational is that they don't always occur. They occur when certain conditions happen. All right? And in this case, the condition is z equals a zero. So these kinds of errors are the worst. They're harder to recreate, right? Because a user might notify you. Let, let's say you have a website that has an error like this somewhere in it. User gets the error. What are they going to do? They might not do anything. They might say, forget your company, I'll go, you know, I'll go to some other company and, and, and buy my stationery or whatever it is they're ordering. I don't know why I picked stationery. I've never bought stationery ever in my life, all right? But with the runtime error, you might not even know that it happens. And what's worse is if you do know what happens, it's possible that you might get sketchy feedback from the person. If they were to call the help desk, they might say, well, I clicked on this, that, and the other, then all of a sudden this error popped up. Well, it's kind of hard to recreate it when you get descriptions like that. All right? You don't always get very precise explanations of what happened from your users. And, you, you know, the, the tendency is for IT people to say, oh, you know, the, these users, they don't tell me what went wrong. Well, it's not their job to debug your code, right? Um, they're doing the best they can. They have their own jobs to perform. And it's your problem that they're telling you about. So don't get all high and mighty saying like, oh, they didn't tell me exactly what's wrong. Well, they might not be in a position to do so. You know, Sure, it's great when they can do that, but you can't necessarily depend on that. So that's a runtime error. It happens when certain conditions are met. And these conditions might be avoidable, or they might be unavoidable. For example, a condition like this would be avoidable if you simply put an if statement around it. All right? If you put an if statement that said, if z is not equal to zero, then do this operation. Otherwise, I don't know, set x to zero, or, or whatever you wanted to do in a case like that. All right? So errors like this, this is a good example of an error that we can anticipate. We know that if z is equal to zero, that is going to cause problems. So we should deal with it one way or another. All right? The third kind of errors are, I'm going to call these semantic errors. Semantic means meaning. You know, syntax errors are the form of the language, right? So x equals y minus z minus. That violates the rules of the language. This is an error that comes forward from many things, but usually it's based on certain conditions. Semantic errors are when your program syntactically is correct, might not even have any runtime errors or the potential for runtime errors, but it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Let's say if you're supposed to take hours times wage rate to get gross pay. But instead of multiplying, you say plus. Gross pay equals hours plus rate. Well, that doesn't violate the rules of language. That's a perfectly legal statement. There's probably no conditions under which that's going to give you a runtime error, all right, provided we know that hours and rate are, are 
longs or, or doubles or whatever. All right. However, that doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Right? You're supposed to multiply those two numbers together and you're adding them. All right. Why do these come out? Well, because of sloppiness, because of um, misunderstanding the requirements, um, thinking that it's supposed to do this when realized it's supposed to multiply. A lot of reasons. Let's talk about these first. These are easy to fix, right? Relatively easy to fix because the compiler tells you you have done something wrong and you have to fix it before you can run your program. These, how do you know you have one of these problems? You don't get the right answer, right? In other words, you, you put in the fact that someone makes $15 an hour and, get, and work 20 hours and their gross pay is, was 15 plus uh, 20, 35, right? It's like $35 gross pay for someone that only works $15 an hour and they work 20 hours? That's not right. All right? So you find this out by testing. Now, to be sure, testing is more complicated than this because there's all kinds of different things. If you think about like an actual payroll program, there's a lot of things that come into play. There's hourly employees, there's contract employees, there's salary employees. Um, when you come to taxes, there's people that are single, there's people that are head of household, there's people who are married, married filing separately, how many deductions you have. There's so many variables that come into play for calculating an actual payroll, right? So it's possible these can be situational too. Maybe everything works fine in the withholding tax calculation, except it doesn't handle married filed separately correctly. All right? There's a bug in there. So everything else works fine. The way around this is testing, testing, testing. And systematic testing. Understanding what are the different paths that your program go through and coming up with a plan to test it. So not haphazardly sitting at your keyboard and just typing in different things to test, but having a good plan, all right? I am going to test uh, a single person with no dependents. I'm going to test a single person with one dependent. I'm going to test a married person with three dependents. You know, coming up with a plan and understanding the code and all the different if statements and branches in it, you can come up with a plan to systematically and thoroughly test this. And that's a big job. Large organizations have quality uh, assurance or quality control departments. I mean, that's a full-time job for some people. All right? That's actually not a bad job for someone interested in getting into software. All right, um, in, in finding things like, uh, finding bugs like this. All right. Typically, you have unit testing, system testing, and then sometimes you have what's called regression testing. Unit testing is where you, where, where you test one piece of the puzzle. System testing is where you test everything together. Regression testing is when you fix something. So let's say, for example, we find a bug with people that are married file, filing separately. And I go in and fix that bug. What should I test? Now, you might say, and it might seem logical, that, well, I would just test married filing separately. That's the thing I fixed, right? Oh, wrong answer. If you really want to test it, you would retest the entire module. All right? You don't know how many times I have heard, all I did was change this one, two, one function, a couple lines of code, fill in the blank. But all I've done is make this small little change that couldn't possibly make this break. And guess what? It made it break. Because... Depending on how software is written, some software, if you make a change in one place, it has an impact elsewhere. Now, your goal for writing good software is that that doesn't happen, but people don't always write good software. So if you're going to test it, you should test it thoroughly again anytime you make a change. 
That's why we're having a test plan is good. Because you can run through those. And it might take some time, but you know what? If it really, if the change really was that isolated, then testing's going to go pretty quickly, right? Because you'll test a single person. Yeah, they're still correct. You'll test a married person. Yeah, they're still correct. You'll go through the scenario. Okay, finally we'll test the married filing separately. Okay, that used to be wrong. Now it's correct. Boom. We can approve this change. All right. Runtime errors. Those are the toughest to check because, again, they're situational. They only pop up under typically unusual conditions. Testing can find some of these, but anticipating them is important as well. So in a case like this, we can prevent that error from happening simply by putting an if statement around it. All right? Let's look at our in, uh, uh, insert statement from last time. It looks something like this. Insert into vote, I think. User ID, poll ID, sequence number. Values, question mark, question mark, question mark. All right. Syntactically, that is correct. If it's not correct, we'll pretend it's correct. Like if I got a column name wrong or something. But syntactically, that's correct. All right. Let's assume the rest of our code, our C-sharp code, is also correct. So we wrote that code correctly. We're connecting to the right database. we setting things right and so on. What are some of the things that could go wrong with this statement? What could cause this statement to blow up? We talked a little bit about this last time. Let's, let's tangibly write on the board the things that could go wrong with this. Exactly. One would be the data types. Data types of values. That's one thing that could go wrong. All right. Now, that's a pretty straightforward one. I hope we'll be able to take care of it. But that is correct. That's something that could go wrong. All right. What is something else that could go wrong? Right. A missing field. All right, that's the second thing that could go wrong. In other words, we're supposed to have a user ID and we don't have a user ID. Or we don't have a sequence number. Or whatever. That's the second thing that could go wrong. It's the third thing that could go wrong. We actually ran into this last time. Yeah. Data already existed. In other words, this is the primary key to this table. So we tried to insert that again. And it blew. we tried to insert another vote. I was trying to stuff the ballot box, right, for kickstart. And we had duplicate here. Now, I'm going to summarize all those things by saying key constraint issues. And what are key constraint issues? They would be issues with the primary key, like a duplicate. They could be foreign key issues, whereas things don't match. In other words, I could have a value for user ID. What if there is no user that has that user ID? You know, I try to do an insert with user 10. And there is no user 10. All right? That's an error. All right? Um, because you had violated the, the, the foreign key constraint on that. There actually is another thing that could happen if you really think out of the box. And this doesn't have anything to do with the statement itself. What if the database is down? What 
who's making changes to that table. All right. Or in the case of other sort of database servers like Oracle or SQL Server, what if the server that that database lives on was being rebooted or crashed? Or the, the database uh, DBMS application crashed? All right. Those are all cases where we can't access the database for whatever reason. So, those are legitimate problems, right? Any application you write, I could go and rename that database and you have written your code perfectly and yet, when you go to do the insert, boom, it crashes. All right? Um, what else? I don't know what else. Could there be something else? Yeah, maybe. All right? When I, when I was describing all the bad weather we could have over the next month, I listed the most common things I could happen, but um, there's things that I didn't mention, you know, that I maybe haven't even thought of. You know, golf ball size hail, freezing rain, you know. Uh, who knows all the kinds of bad weather we can have here, right? So, there's another category of error is unexpected. And it's unexpected in the sense that we don't know specifically what could go wrong, but we know that something else might go wrong that we just haven't anticipated. So, yeah, there's going to be bad weather. I don't know exactly what it is, but there's a good chance over the next month there's going to be bad weather. So, if we want our program to really be fault tolerant, we have to account for these things. Now, there's different ways that we could account for these things. All right, there's different strategies that we can take. Let me think, let's try to think and let's try to define the different things that we could do to prevent errors in general. <coughs> Number one, we could prevent the error from ever happening. All right? And that sounds silly, but there's things we can do for that. All right? Maybe not all these kinds of errors, but some of them we could prevent from ever happening. Missing field. How do you keep a missing field from happening? Validation. Right? That would be a way of doing that. And we can make sure we never try to do execute that statement if there isn't a field for user ID and, uh, um, what's the other fields, poll ID and sequence number. So validation, we could prevent the missing field problem from happening. All right? Now, it's not going to prevent some of these other things from happening, but we can put code in to prevent the error from happening. Second thing, and, and we can do that a couple different ways. We can prevent it from happening, or we can let the user make the mistake, and then catch it before we try to execute the statement. So we can try to catch the error before it happens, one way or another. That's strategy number one. Strategy number two is a little bit different. We can let the error happen and be there to clean it up. All right? Some of these things we can't necessarily prevent from happening. How can you as a programmer prevent that someone opens up a database table exclusively? You can't. Right? You can't write code that's going to keep a DBA from opening up the database table and, and manipulating it. But if that happens, you can handle the error. All right? You can handle the error and you can handle it gracefully. And you can handle it in a way. What do I mean by handling it gracefully? You tell the user that there is an error so they don't think that it worked, 
right? So if they tried to cast a vote and they press submit and the database was, was down, someone was in a, the database table or you couldn't access it, give the user a message and say, hey, your vote didn't take. Try and, and then tell them what to do. Maybe the answer is try again later. All right. The other thing you could do is you could log to a, uh, um, to, you could log somewhere that says that you had this problem. So your developers could look at your error log and get a report of what happened. Remember I said that users don't always give a good description of exactly what went wrong? They might not even tell you. If I was on a site and I went to vote for something and gave me an error, it's like, well, fine. It's that kind of site. I just, I just won't use it anymore, right? But if it handled the error gracefully and says, well, try again later and handled it in a user-friendly way, I'm more apt to continue to try to use that site. But in the meantime, I could log an error. And I could write somewhere that says, hey, such and such user at such and such time tried to insert a row into the vote table, here's the values, and it blew up. And then the developers can look into it and, and try to determine what was going on. Was there some database maintenance during that time of day? You know, was there, you know, were tables name, renamed or was the database renamed or did some parameters in the database change? That at least gives you something to go, to, to go investigate. So, we can prevent the error from happening we can let the error happen and handle it. Those are, in general speaking, two ways that we can keep that from happening. We've already talked about ways to, and you should already be familiar with some ways to keep errors from happening in the first place. Validation, for example. You know, maybe not in this case so much, but if you think of inserting into another table and you had a form, you can have validation for all the fields. Put a required validator on the required fields. Right? Makes sense. You could put a, um, a, a, a range validator if the value had to be between certain numbers. You could put a data type validator if it had to be an integer or a, a date or something like that. So validation and just the manner in which you design your form can make sure some of these things don't happen. For example, getting to our, our vote example. Uh, going back to our vote example. Um, what do I want to say here? Oh, we have radio buttons, right? We don't allow the user to type in the name of their choice so that someone types in kickstart and makes it as one word and someone types in kickstart and makes it as two words or misspells one of the words or whatever, all right? We use radio buttons. So we limit the choices to valid choices. So the way that we can design our form can help prevent certain errors from happening. So by the way we design our form and by validation, we can keep some errors from happening. All right? Yet, there's always the unexpected. There's always the stuff that we can't necessarily predict or code around. And therefore, we also need the ability to detect if an error occurred and then handle it a certain way. All right? Now, those of you that have done C-sharp programming before, what does that sound like? Letting an error happen and then handling it. A try catch A try-catch. All right. What is a try catch? How does that work? Well, there's two parts of it. What does try mean? What do you put in try? The statement is that you want to try to execute. All right. What do you put in the catch part? In the catch part, you put the code that you want to have happen if certain errors occur. Now, you can fine tune this to the degree that you need to. All right, we're going to write a real simple case of a try catch, and uh, probably in the advanced C sharp class, maybe you cover it in more detail, um, or maybe in the C sharp class, I, I don't know exactly where this is covered, but we're going to use a very basic form of the try catch. 
All right. So we're going to put our code in a try catch block. And we're going to say, go and try these statements. And if you have a problem, do this. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to download the application. I'm going to go and I'm going to try to vote again. All right. And my first pass through, I'm going to simply catch that error when it happens and warn the user. Now, actually, voting again is something I could handle either way. I could prevent the user from getting to that page. All right. Or I could let them try to vote again and display an error message. So we'll do that one first. All right. Um, really, how do I want to say this? Um, generally speaking, it's best if you can prevent an error from happening. But since we're talking about try catches, I'm going to do the try catch to try to vote again and then catch the problem. Maybe after we finish this, I'll talk about, I won't necessarily do, how we could make sure that they couldn't even try to vote again. Is it extra dark in here today? Yeah. Maybe just how it is outside, or maybe the drapes are drawn more. I think this is dark now, but cloudy outside. Yeah, probably. Oh, don't forget to set your class back. Is that this week or next week? I thought it was this week. Though. I thought it was this week too, but someone told me it's next week. It's what is next, next week? week? Just set the class back. Yeah. Or is it? I don't know. I'll tell you what. Everyone show up at 9.15, 10.15, and 11.15 next week. All right? <laughs> what time are you going to show up? At one of those. <laughs> <laughs> October, yeah. and I think uh, it was recently changed to the first weekend in November. Yeah, because I saw a poster, I think it was in the school somewhere, that it said it was going to be for this weekend. Even my calendar says this weekend. Um, is it possible that the U.S. is under a different set of rules than other people? Yeah, because in Europe it's this weekend. Okay. It's coming weekend, that's why. And then over here it's always a week later. Well, that explains it. They're on the metric system over there. That was a joke. <laughs> I thought you were serious for a second. <laughs> that's why I was laughing. Well, that's all the more reason to laugh if you thought I was serious. Oh, I didn't want to laugh. Oh, how, how, how kind. You were serious. How kind. <laughs> Okay, so here is our voting application. And let me open up Visual Studio. Yeah, which takes, yeah. We'll have time to talk about daylight savings time and if anyone has a good Halloween costume. And oh, I do. You do? What is that? We're going to do the Lucky Dead. I'm going to be Deacon as a girl. Okay. My daughter's going to be Carl. My son's going to be um, Rick. And my niece is going to be a tiny Michelle. Okay. Wow. A group costume. Yeah. I, I don't watch The Walking Dead, but I 
have a feeling The Walking Dead is one of those shows that if you just hear the title, you have a pretty good idea about what it's about, you know, which I like. I appreciate that. Oh, there's a contest? Yeah. I've won it every year, so. I, I was at a Halloween party, and I got ripped off one time. I, ha I clearly had the best costume. Oh, no. And I put together my costume, and someone else, like, bought their costume, and they See, ended up winning. Right. I right. was so mad. I mean, <laughs> I was madder than you would expect I would get over something like that. The voting was rigged. <laughs> it was funny, one year my high school class seniors decided we were going to do a haunted house, and we've been doing it ever since then, but this one kid who acted all big and bad as he came through the haunted house, he gets to the end where the girl gets chainsawed in half, he's running down the street three blocks away, we can still hear, ah, oh, cut her neck, cut her neck, <laughs> I don't. I don't know if it is, if I'm like too rational for my own good. But when you go into a place that is designed to have creepy, scary things, it makes it hard for me to be scared. Like if I was walking down the hall and I saw something like that, I'd be terrified. But if I go into a place where they say we are going to try to scare you, it, it's like I have a hard time getting scared. What's funny was the three-year-old walked through the haunted house three times and asked her mom to go again. Wow. She laughed the whole way through it. That would be my niece. I might keep an eye on that kid. I <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to log in. Maybe. And I'm going to try to vote again in the energy drink question. And it's going to break. Now, user won't see this. We're seeing this because we're in debug mode. I'm going to go and hit continue, though. This gives me an idea of what's going on. It tells me that there's a duplicate primary key. I'm going to hit continue in debug. This is what the user would see. Actually, I'm, I'm, actually, that's not even completely true. The user might see, depending on how you have your application configured, the user may see this error, or they may see an error that's even less specific, right? Um, in web applications, you will show different errors when you're debugging, than when you are running the application live. And that's a good thing. Why is that? Hackers can actually glean information from your error messages to know stuff about how your database is constructed. For example, um, not necessarily in this case, but I guess they get a tiny bit of information from this. And they could probably reverse engineer and do some thinking about exactly what is wrong. But because of that, because you don't want to tip off your hand and give, give people uh, with nefarious motivations any information about your system, a lot of times you'll simply give a more obscure error message that will simply say, you know, there was an error. Again, 
This doesn't tell the user what to do. Unless the user understands database terminology, this probably doesn't give them an idea of like what the problem is. You know, a simple declarative statement that says, "Hey, you probably already voted for this one," or maybe the database is down for maintenance. Try again in 15 minutes. If it happens again, quit voting in this category. All right, would be maybe a much better way to communicate to the user because you tell the user in terms they understand what went wrong and what they need to do to fix it. All right, and then we could log it. So when you have runtime errors, someone's going to handle it. Either you're going to handle it or the ASP.NET framework is going to handle it. When the ASP.NET framework handles it, it doesn't handle it in a particular user-friendly way. All right? It simply spits out an error message. All right? Not in necessarily a user-friendly way. Therefore, you want to handle it. You want to handle it so that you can explain to the user what probably went wrong. Now remember, with the wild card that I threw on the end of the list, it's possible something else went wrong that I'm just not aware of, but I can be pretty sure if this insert fails, either the database is down or it's a duplicate key. All right? Um, and then what they need to do, you know, if you, if you, you know, you are only permitted to vote once in a category, you know, I could show them what they voted. I could say, remember, on this date, you voted this. You know, um, I could give them the option to change their vote if they wanted to. Take them to a, a different panel on the page that would allow them to edit their vote. Whatever. I could do a lot of different things. All right. Um, and I could log it somewhere. I could create a file to log it. Now, here's just sort of an interesting thought. Do I want to log it in the database? Probably not. Because if the database is crashed and I try to log it in the database, well, my logging message is going to crash. So I will probably output to just simply a simple sequential text file a message that says what went wrong. Okay, so the lesson of this, if you don't handle it, ASP.NET will, and you probably won't like the way that it handles it. So you should handle it. Does that mean that you put try catches around every single statement in your program? Not necessarily. All right. But you can sort of guess the things that are likely to go wrong based on our discussion of runtime errors. You know, anytime you have user input, make sure that user input is valid before you go to process it. There's really nothing I can do here, or there's really nothing I could do to make sure the database didn't crash immediately before doing the insert. So I'm not going to try to prevent this error. I'm going to, I'm just simply going to be there to clean up after it. So let's go and let's put the try catch block in here. So what does a try catch block look like in C sharp? Well, try Then we have the braces around it.
บบนี Simply tell me it's not used. So I got a warning now. I think there's another variable called e is the problem. I think there's an argument to this function. Yeah, event arguments is e. So I use that name. So I can't use e again. All right. What kind of error is? What kind of exception is this catching? In other words, what problem is it looking for? Yes, that's a problem that it's going to find, all right? But this code is looking for what specific exception? Can't vote okay. Uh, again, yes, that's the exception that we are going to cause. But would this catch, well, let me, let, me, let me rephrase the question. If I were to go and pull up this page and rename the database, would this exception catch it? Was that a yes or no? Yes. Yes, yes it will. So in other words, this is going to catch any problem. All right? This is going to catch any exception that gets thrown. So yes, it's correct. We're going to catch the duplicate key example. But it would also catch uh, if someone had that table exclusively open. It would also catch the error if uh, someone renamed the database, someone deleted the database, someone changed the web config file to point to a non-existent database, and so on. So when I say exception, I am catching any exception. In these examples here, you see we can fine tune that. Here we're catching a specific kind of exception. This is useful if you want to do different things or give different error messages depending on the exact thing that went wrong. All right? So I could break this down and look for different sorts of exceptions. But I'm not going to. That's something for, that's something for um, advanced C-sharp or, or another day or, or something like that. Now, I'm actually not sure I can do that in this case. I think all things like that come by as a SQL exception. But again, I'm not really sure. At any rate, we are catching every exception. So what do we want to do? Well, the first thing we want to do is we want to inform the user. All right? Now, we can inform the user a couple different ways. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put on my page, I'm going to put a label. I'm going to smash my face on the keyboard, and that's what the label is going to be called. That would be great fun when I use this example next semester or something in the online version, and people's like, why is that label called G H U R B N? It's like that's the contour of my face. <laughs> so without giving any spoilers, in case people have not watched it, were you traumatized by Walking Dead this weekend? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, that 
that actually should be a poll. Uh, uh, that's the next. That's the next one that I'm going to add. Were you traumatized by the Walking Dead episode of of, of ten? What would that have been? Twenty four. No, because if you read the comic books. Ah, I, I, I've heard people say that. It, it, it's, it was portrayed exactly how the comic books are. I I don't watch it, but like everyone on my Facebook feed, seemed to be. Someone actually posted like on Monday. It's like. To all my Walking Dead fan friends, like, are you guys okay today? You know. <laughs> I don't have cable, so I don't watch it. Yeah, I, I, I don't have cable either. Um, I have uh, Sling. I don't even have that. Yeah. Which, I have GTV Box. <laughs> yeah, which uh, I should get to sponsor uh, my classes. You know, I could talk about Sling maybe once a lecture. And, and they could, I don't know, maybe give me, I'll, 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 if you're out there from sling, I'll do it for just free sling. All right? Just, I only want any money, just, just no fee. And I want the highest package you can get. Because right now I think I have the second tier package. But I saved, I ended up saving a lot of money doing that. I, unfortunately, like, I can't watch the World Series, though. That's kind of a bummer. Well, last night, if you're an Indians fan, you didn't Yeah, last night I didn't want one to, right, right. Um... ESPN actually, uh, their site like, actually has like a live cast where they show like everything that happens. Like the last pitch was in the lower right of the strike. You know, it's like, oh, okay, that's that's important for me to know. Yeah. Well, Fox stations got in trouble because they didn't air the first pitches for the past two games, and apparently all their fans were yelling at them. Wow, this is bad. It's computer. Well, I assumed it wasn't me. All right, I'm not. I'm not that sensitive that I think that it's the way that I clicked on the on the mouse that. Could have been. Yeah. I didn't click hard enough, so it wasn't sure that I wanted to pull up this page. want one of those, maybe I can get like one of those like in the frames of my glasses. So if someone asked me a question and I wasn't really paying attention, they can like the not respond and can pop up. You know? Or like if I had like, if I did get much sleep the night before or I haven't had my coffee, you know. Um, why is why am I getting an error in this if statement? It's like not responding. And then it's like finally it kicks, you know, it, it clicks in. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, you forgot the bracket. If I'd realized this, I would have done it in code view. That's what I was talking about, how it keeps crashing on me. It yeah. keeps doing that and not responding. You know what I how much memory do you have in it? On my computer? Mm -hmm. um, 12. Okay. Check the, the requirements for that. Okay. A lot of times, I mean, that's what this... Typically, problems like this, either the processor isn't fast enough or, or you don't have sufficient memory for this. I love how you're getting a little red no sign. Pardon me? Every, the circle will stop turning blue. Yeah, it turns into that. Yeah, right. <laughs> like, nope. No, you're not allowed. Free burrito, but cheap burrito action. Yeah. But Dave and Buster's has a thousand dollar costume contest Saturday. Oh, mine won't be that good. I 
I really wonder if some of this isn't for the fact that this machine has deep freeze on it, which means that as you reboot it, so this is like acting, every day it acts as though it's the first time it's ever run in Visual Studio, so it has to do some initialization. I mean, there, there's always been problems, but never like, this is like the most extreme I've seen it. I mean, even this semester, you know, it's not exactly been speedy, but. All right, against my better judgment, I'm going to take your advice. do like one <laughs> character at a time. Your vote wasn't, didn't count, all right? Your vote wasn't saved. 
Here's what I think happened. Maybe you're trying to vote again on something you've already voted. If that's not the case, maybe there's a temporary problem with the database, try again later. So I give them clear instructions about what I think is wrong or what else could be wrong and what they should do about it. Either don't vote again or try again later. I could then, if I wanted to, log this, write this out to a file so that I could go and review the file as a developer later on. And let's double check to see if this works. All right. Did you notice what happened? No, it, it, it told me that I was logged out, and it gave me a vote button, all right, because there's no question and there's no user ID. If I click this, boy, am I going to get an error, all right? So I could actually write code to test to see if, if, if they're logged in, and if not, redirect them to the login page, because they shouldn't get to the vote page if they're not logged in. So I forgot to make the start page login. We can talk about that again in, in subsequent classes. Okay, M. Zellers at Lorraine CCC.edu. Password. Vote. Kickstart. All right, there, we get a user-friendly error, and we could have logged it, and so on. All right, there's all kinds of things we could do along these lines to catch that, but it starts when you anticipate what things could go wrong, and anticipate what things are better um, to catch those errors. Um, other things we could do, again, we could prevent them from even getting to the vote page if they're not logged on and if there's nothing in the query string. Um, we will look at some of those things um, next week. Next week, I am not sure what day we're going to do it. We may actually have a pizza lunch in here, all right, so that you can work and program at the same time. Um, and I'm going to aim to give you time to catch up on your programming. So that very well might be Tuesday or Thursday. All right, we'll, we'll, I'm going to play it by ear. If I know something definitely, I will post an announcement. Um, any questions at this point? All right, we'll, I'm going to go open up the lab, then I will be back here to get all the files, which I hope went okay. <laughs>